We've got a great episode for you today. We're going to be talking about narcolepsy. It's a sleep disorder that makes it difficult for a person to go to sleep and then also difficult for them to stay awake. We've got Brian Mann. He's been living with narcolepsy and he's going to be talking about his diagnosis. He's going to be talking about his vivid dreams. He's going to be talking about his work life and how he deals with that. And then also he's going to be talking about how his college friends played some pranks on him early on before his diagnosis. And then stick around, we're going to be talking about some sleep hygiene that all of us can use, whether you're uh, living with narcolepsy or not. So uh, let's get into the show. It starts now. Brian, you are uh, living with narcolepsy? Yes. And how long have you been living with that? 40 plus years. 40 plus years. Okay. So That uh, I know of. <laughs> right? Um, was there like a turning point? Like, you know, had you been tired or, and then all of a sudden you had a severe episode or... Um, so from what I remember, I mean, the, the turning episode might've been, and that's the thing with narcolepsy, certain things can cause certain events. And, and so there's once upon a time in my childhood, there's a rock that kind of went up in the air and fell on my head. And maybe it was from that afterwards. I, I don't remember. All I know is I got a twin brother and I got it and he doesn't. And Oh, wow. Okay. He yeah. also didn't have a rock in his head. But other than that, we've had a lot of the same things through our our lives. Um, sometimes it's triggered by being uh, through illness, through chicken pox or whatever, if you're severe. Um, but we both went through the same thing. And yeah, I know. So uh, who knows? <laughs> yeah, medical people love to study twins for that exact reason. Of you. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So I never really realized it until, you know, I mean, it, for me, it was just a matter of life. So growing up and, and falling asleep in classes continuously on the buses, wherever, it was just part of life. I really didn't think I had a problem until my wife, then girlfriend, told me I had a problem. And that was in college. That's because you fell asleep on all the rom-com movies? Yeah, like yeah, I do? exactly. <laughs> <laughs> hey, no. Uh, but uh, so that's interesting. So kind of over a period of time, she's kind of like, hey, why don't you get it checked out? Or Yeah, it was always... I don't know. I mean, even in high school, I guess it was just um, when you're in college, you get your roommates that really can uh, take advantage of the situation. So I've woke up many times with shaved legs or oh uh, <laughs> thrown off the bu top bunk is where I had a top bunk. And I would, you know, thrown it to a concrete floor. I'd just sleep through it. Holy so cow. I had lots of stuff done to me while I was in college. Just oh, nice. And so she's probably yeah, thinking... So you got some kind of problem. You got to get checked out. So yeah, well, those are good you know, friends. I, I really had no idea um, until we went to see a sleep specialist. And once we did, we I got diagnosed pretty quickly, going through sleep tests and, and stuff. So and then you kind of so you get to say, hey, have you ever heard of narcolepsy? Yeah. So my wife kind of she's much better at this stuff than I am. So she kind of read about this and kind of looked up symptoms and. So she, she was the one that kind of brought me there okay. um, or else, you know, who knows? I probably would have still really? be undiagnosed this day. So. And then narcolepsy is not necessarily, it's, you know, something that's chronic, but, you know, you're not going to die from it or anything like that for the illness itself. Right. But there are some, some things that you need to be aware of, I guess. Yeah. So it's a chronic illness, uh, disability. Uh, it's we got it for our lives. Hopefully, someday they'll come up with something. For now, it's a matter of um, a mixture of trying different medicines, lifestyle uh, changes, and really just a lot of uh, support. Um, you know, most of the time we can, well, depending on the severity, uh, sometimes, uh, at least for me, uh, a lot of times once uh, things are going, everything is okay. But there are episodes where uh, things can get rough. You get very tired. You can't do things. You can't think. You might, I might fall asleep in the middle of a sentence here. I've done that before. Mm -hmm. um, so there are some things that are out of your control. So when you're going throughout life, um, you just got to be aware of that. And, and hopefully the people around you are supportive of that so that they can help you along as well. Yeah, so what if, uh, you know, you were to have an episode now, like what are the people around you supposed to do and not throw you off bunk beds or anything no. like that? You know, we're, we're not in college. Um, if something were to happen to me right now, it's just let it ride. Um, so one of the couple of things that might happen if I had a cataplectic episode, which means uh, cataplexy is something, um, it can be 
severe to the point where I pass out or it looks like I pass out, except I'm actually awake. I'm not unconscious. So that's the difference between just passing out and having a cataplexic episode. Or it can be just, uh, you know, you lose uh, feelings in parts of your body or your face uh, may start drooping. So for different people, different things happen. Some people get it a lot. I get it very infrequently right now, um, maybe once a month or something like that. And it's usually something drawn by emotion. Mm-hmm. So, and that's why there's a higher chance it happens today because you get emotional talking about this stuff. Oh, okay. And then talking about that gets you emotional and then it sets that off. So, unfortunately, <laughs> you, you feel like you got to be a little cold hearted or cold faced about things because you can't have those emotions because if you do you're going to collapse possibly okay so that's one of the really hard parts about um, going through that and so the last time that happened was almost it was at work when we were having a a guest speaker uh, who had a disability she was speaking about overcoming certain trials and tribulations I got emotional about it but so I just went on my computer started typing and, and wouldn't quit typing until that episode passed Oh, okay. Otherwise, I would have probably just passed out. So it's just let it ride. Um, if I start talking different languages or oh, wow. because uh, my parasomnia might kick in. So it may look like I'm awake or feel like I'm awake, but I might do stuff. It's really just to make sure they don't, person doesn't go towards stairs yeah. or, you know, they yeah. start walking away. But other than that, it, it's really just let it ride. It will awesome. come out of it. I mean, I've eaten dinner a few times. Um, while I was asleep. So we had a student here from Italy that he found it pretty interesting. He was a medical student. And so he, he knew I had narcolepsy. We disclosed all that uh, when he came here. But there's a couple times he just was like, is he okay? Talking about me. It's like, no, nah, he's asleep. And I started eating, just eating dinner with everybody else. But then I started talking about stories and kind of playing with my food. I wanted to invent games with the food, with peas. We're playing. Uh, It's a whole (laughs) interesting story there. But, you know, so twice while he was here, uh, I ate dinner with him asleep. So, you know, there's nothing really dangerous about it. I mean, I ate. I didn't choke. uh, But if I were to just later on, all I did is I got up from my chair in the middle of dinner, in the middle of conversation, just laid on the couch and. That's so, what I remember is just I was on the couch and I was when I went to sleep and I was on the couch when I woke up. I don't remember anything else. OK, yeah, that's what I was about to say. Like, you know, because you said you can kind of hear things and you're thinking, but you're not necessarily recording those. So uh, just kinda... It depends on the, the state that you're in. If you're in a cataplectic uh, state, then you're still awake, but you can still. And that's a very short episode, usually just a few minutes. When I'm in my parasomnia, that's like a longer episode. And again, it might last only usually longer, 10 minutes, but it could last hours. Oh, wow. Um, and it could be something that I'd just fall into. Again, it doesn't happen a lot that I know of. Mm-hmm. I think it happens just a little bit. Uh, like in the mornings, my wife can tell if I'm kind of glazed over and... <laughs> Not talking, you know, some things make sense, not everything. Right. You know, my wife would tell me to go get something from somewhere. I'm like, okay, I'll go to the farmhouse and get it. And I'll go to the bedroom and get what she wanted. But here I am thinking, and I'm still kind of half asleep thinking kinda I'm going to a farmhouse to get something. Wow. So I might do some of it. And, and Have so. they ever uh, looked at you or looked at anyone um you know, as far as uh, like the brain waves during these episodes, like what's kind of happening there? Yeah, I've had lots of sleep studies. Mm-hmm. So I've had lots of scans and stuff like that. So um, what they all came out to be, I, I don't know exactly. I haven't really seen my results or really don't want to see my results. <laughs> right. kind of scares me. I don't know. Yeah. But I've had uh, probably about two dozen tests on me so far. Okay. Um they could be all day events, sometimes just at night. Yeah. So at first they're at night, but then they do other ones to see how you are. Um, one of the things with narcolepsy, the biggest factor is usually what's called EDS, excessive daytime sleepiness. And that's because we're not getting restful sleep. So it's hard for us to stay awake during the day. Okay. And so most of the time when we talk about narcolepsy, we're talking about excessive daytime sleepiness. And in order to really test that, you got to 
uh, do an all-day study, and they take little naps uh, during the day and see how long does it take you to fall asleep and what happens. And so the average person will fall asleep, like, well, for when they go to bed, like 30, 60 minutes, they'll fall into REM sleep. So they might fall asleep quickly, but they don't go into their REM, into their dreams, until about 60 minutes later. Um, people with narcolepsy fall into that very quickly. And so for me, it was under two minutes every time I'm dreaming. Two minutes, and you're having pretty vivid dreams? And... Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, nice. That's yeah, good well, and that's, that's a good thing, and that's a bad thing. So, yeah, I've got the most colorful, best dreams in the world as far as uh, production. Nice. <laughs> the colors are just awesome. They're in colors and vivid sound. Uh, and, and that's one of the really neat factors in it, or maybe not so neat, is, you know, once I leave here, I, I couldn't tell you what you're wearing, mm -hmm. what shirt, jeans, whatever. But in my dreams, I can tell you every single stitch on a shirt. And every single person that was, and there could be hundreds of people. So in real life, I'm terrible with details, terrible with, my wife will get a haircut, I won't notice it for a week. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that could be a but problem. But in my dreams, I notice every single detail, every single sound. I still can see it. I still can hear it. Um, and most of my dreams aren't very scary. They're more adventurous. Although lately my dreams, uh, if I sleep for a long time, I got a reoccurring theme of, not not a good theme, but uh, it's trying to, I know I'm sleeping too long, I need to wake up. The only way I can wake up is to get out of my dream. So I'm actually looking for someone with a gun to shoot me oh, wow. uh, and kill me so I can wake up. Uh, and I know that. Yeah, and so heavy. in my dream, if I sleep too long, my dreams always go towards that. Um, but otherwise, it's just adventures. Now, some people have scary dreams or when they go into sleep or come out of sleep, they get what's called, and I'm going to really mess this up, but hypnagogic episodes or hallucinations. And so they see demons and spirits. And even when they're kind of awake, they're kind of like in that, but they see things. Wow. Uh, now, I don't get that. So that's the one good thing I don't get. My dreams aren't scary. They're just very adventurous. Not to say that they're not bad. I mean, I, I've had a dream, probably my... Uh, most unfortunate dream was being in a cavern with my 90 year old mother oh, and wow. we we're <laughs> jumping from ledges to ledges for some reason. It was like Indiana Jones or something. And so there was one ledge where she fell and I caught her. And so I held on to her, but the fingers started slipping. And so unfortunately she fell. And when she did, her head hit a rock and I can still hear her skull hitting that rock to this very day. And so for me in that dream, it wasn't scary. It was just part of the dream. But it was like, man, I, I, can, I can see it. I can hear it. It was just so vivid. And, you know, it was just unimaginable. And but so, for me in that dream, it wasn't actually a scary thing. And that's because I guess you're, you know it's a dream. Right. I mean, you, well, yeah, sometimes I, I like, you know, so. we'll call out. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, do you ever call out like, you know, or. Whoa, oh, yeah, you know? I do all the time. OK. Yeah, I, I do. And I do not as much, but I used to sleepwalk a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it all depends on there are certain medications or certain things you can do to try to suppress um, things a little bit more. But I had a couple bad episodes where I was actually awake. My wife and kids, they, they left the house, and I was doing something on my computer, and I was like asleep with it. So my wife hid it in a great spot. And somehow, I found it. I don't even know where it was. She said it was like in a closet, <laughs> behind stuff, and all this. And in my sleep, I ended up finding it, and I was back on my computer. Um, and another time, I woke up. Uh, I was taking Ambien at the time. No. Oh, wow. Yeah, I was taking Ambien at the time. And I got up, I had a bad headache. So in my sleep, I guess, I went to get Advil. But instead of Advil, I took Ambien. They had an A or something like that. Uh oh. And that got dangerous because here I am already on Ambien and I'd pop, you know, four or five, six more. Oh, wow. And so that was a night where she had to make sure I made it through the night okay. Yeah, definitely. Because I was really delirious. Um, 
And there have been a couple times where I made a pizza in the oven with the cardboard or plastic on it and burned down the oven. So oh, no. set fire to the house. So she, uh, obviously, there are precautions that she needs to make yeah. and I need to make. Uh, so locking up medication at night after my Ambien episode. Mm-hmm. Um, and <laughs> trying not... Uh, there's twice I made mozzarella sticks. I think another time I don't. Know. There are a few things that I've, I've done where it's like I just somehow got to keep away from refrigerators yeah. and ovens and <laughs> probably yeah step away from the kitchen. <laughs> so you know those are far few in between, um, but unfortunately those things can happen. And um, but on the most part, you know it's just more or less funny for everybody else. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad. Yeah. I mean, definitely sounds like a couple of scary episodes, but for the most part, it sounds like by catching it, I guess in college, you've obviously adjusted things and tried to, yeah. Um, so there's no family history of it. There's no, not that I'm aware of. Right. Um, matter of fact, I didn't even know anybody that had narcolepsy until just a few years ago. Oh, wow. So for me, it was really, I was just, I've been on my own. I've never really looked and it was just something I lived with, and mm-hmm. I really, uh, you know, it was hard enough on everybody in my family. I didn't want to cause any more anxiety by, you know, being, trying to get more involved or trying to find out more and, you know, spend more time on it. I, I already wasted enough time. Right. I, I felt, you know, sleeping that uh, I wasn't going to spend any more time trying to research this or whatever. And so, but I just got to a, a point where, you really feel all alone um, because you're, you know, just in such a, you feel like you're hurting yourself, you're hurting others, your family, because you can't do what you need to do all the time. You can't do what you want to do all the time, mm-hmm. what others want you to do all the time. So, I mean, it even gets to the point, you know, my, my son's graduation, I couldn't make it. I oh, couldn't wow. wake up. That so the family went, I had to watch it at home. Yeah. Um, and so... You know, sometimes it's the little things. And then it gets down to the bigger things, like with work and stuff. You know, um, 30% or more people with narcolepsy, including me, have lost their jobs because of it. Oh, wow. Um, Because, you know, there are certain things, if we take certain medications, we might get what's called brain fog, which is like driving drunk. And so, you know, it's, it's a risk not only to yourself, but everyone else on a freeway or on the road, or, you know, pedestrians, or drivers, or passengers. And so, you're going to take the chance to get to work in order, you know, and something might happen. Uh, Or, you know, um, one of the things that really helps when you have narcolepsy is to take naps. And so, that may not always be the most convenient thing, depending on your job, to take a nap. Um, But if certain accommodations like that can be made, then that helps. Mm-hmm. But even if it's available, it doesn't mean companies are receptive to it. Right. And so uh, that's what happened to me is the combination of the, the brain fog. Uh, also, a change in medication. So, um, you know, I, I've never had accommodation accommodations in over 30 years of working. Um, but I needed it for about a year and a half change in medication. Sure. So. After a while, some people can be on medication for a long time. I know a guy who was on something called Zyrum for 30 years, ever since I think it was developed. Well, for me, I've been on Zyrum twice each time for maybe a year and a half, and then it no longer worked. So I had to find something new. Oh, wow. And each time you do that, you got to go through uh, sleep tests, or you got to get off one medicine, be clean for a month before you go on another, um, or you got to titrate up. Which means you got to start very low right. to yeah, get you to be the correct dosage. Those. Yeah, you can't just cut out. Even you can't when just you're getting out. off medicine, you got to titrate down. Yeah. So that takes time, and so you know during that period of time, you need to make adjustments. You know, again, you can't just hop in a car and drive. Right. Um, and and so not everyone um, can accommodate those things or want to, and and so unfortunately that becomes a problem. Um, not only for me, but then my whole family and stuff. And, and so that was a really hard part for me. And that's, again, I, I knew nobody with narcolepsy until I got fired. And, and I really hit my lows. 
mm-hmm. of, you know, who am I as a person? I can't provide for my family. I can't work. I can't do this. Although it was just a temporary situation, um, being fired made it worse because then I lost my insurance. So I lost the mm-hmm. medication oh, that wow. actually started working. So I lost that. So I had to start all over. And so it was a bad period of time. And, but I met a great group of people through some of the support groups that are out there for narcolepsy. And, and since then, I think there are six different organizations that are out there that I've come to know and the people within that. So I've gone from knowing nobody with narcolepsy yeah. to mm, probably like 50 or 60 people with oh, it wow, throughout yeah. the U.S., a couple in Houston now, um, which before I knew nobody in Houston. I mean, Houston's a big city. There's got to right. be one person that's got somebody, narcolepsy other than me. Somebody in a million. Yeah, definitely. And we'll uh, put some of those links down in the uh, description below. So yeah, yeah, thank people you. can yeah, check that out for sure. So, uh, so let's go through some maybe some kind of like quick facts. Uh, um, are males and females, how are they affected? You know, it, it's pretty proportionate, both males and females. I know more females personally um, that have it just because more of them are in are on the online support. Mm. Um, so if I were to just look at that, I would think more females. But according to the statistics, it's males and females about evenly. Okay. And then the symptoms, when do they usually start? They can start at any time. Um, so anywhere from childhood to uh, being an adult. Um, what happens is a lot of times with narcolepsy, there's a certain... Uh, gene that uh, there's already something there um, that may trigger. So it may lay silent in you for like 15 years, 20 years, you don't know. But then something triggers it. And so that trigger for me, maybe it was the rock that fell on my head. Or for some people, maybe it's an illness. Um, The youngest person that ever had narcolepsy, it was for her, it was actually for the I think it was a, the bird flu or swine flu vaccination. Oh, um, right. Just because it kind of replicated, it kind of looked like one of the, the genes or one of the proteins that uh, were involved. And so that might have been a trigger there um, in England and, and in Europe. So there are certain things. Now, not everything is known about it. So, you know, not everyone can remember a trigger or know of a trigger. So whether or not that's what actually happens or something else, um, but it could happen at any period of time, really, during your life. And it's estimated how many people are living with I think around the U.S., it's, it's probably around 200,000. So it's a, it's a rare disease, but not the rarest disease. Yeah, and you were talking about, you know, you went 30-plus years or so without knowing anyone around it. So i got to think that that number is probably more. Either yeah, people and don't it's, know they it's been probably diagnosed or, a lot more prevalent. It's just... It's undiagnosed and misdiagnosed. Even for me, before I went to a sleep doctor, you know, it was just fatigue or it was stress or it was ADHD or it was just depression. And and so you get all these other diagnoses and not really getting to the true diagnosis of what what you're suffering from. And everything else then is either a symptom or could be it's called a comorbidity uh, that coexists with it. So, yeah, I might have depression, but why do I have depression? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and it kind of coexists with my narcolepsy. And that's like something that triggers, like there's some kind of like, uh, like you get a jolt of some kind of adrenaline or, or not adrenaline, like, you know, whatever tells your body to go to sleep, mm. somehow that's what you just activate more of that. And that's yeah, what kind of... So it's, um, yeah, so there's a, a hype, what's an enzyme called hypocretin or orexin, hypocretin. And, and so what it is is that they think from different studies that those with narcolepsy, especially type 1, so there's uh, type 1, type 2, type 1's with cataplexy. So you might have those episodes of, of uh, falling or your facial features. Um, and type 2 is really without the cataplexy. Now, those with type 1, generally they have a lower level of that hypocretin, the orexin. Um, And with the type 2, they really don't know what causes the narcolepsy. And so whether it's usually that involved, so they can find out, first of all, there's a certain gene. If they do a a puncture 
uh, your spine, spinal, and they can uh, determine whether or not, first of all, if you have the gene for it, and whether or not then the conditions exist. Um, so, and, and it kind of involves, um, and I'm not very good with medical terms, a hypothalamus <laughs> right. or something, you know, which also regulates temperature. So uh, oftentimes, like with me, um, I get very hot very fast. Hmm. So I have trouble regulating my temperature. I actually wear oh, a wow. device on my wrist that my wife got me. She was great. Oh, nice. That helps cool me off because I get very hot very quickly. Huh. It also helps uh, when I get panic attacks or anxiety attacks. Um, so it serves as a distraction for me. Again, another comorbidity. But so these things, it, it just kind of comes on. Um, you know, when we get tired, sometimes it's just a matter of, you know, you just get exhausted real quick. Um, you're, or it might be that your eyes just keep closing on you. you. You think you're staying awake, you're doing your best, but your eyes keep closing on you and you can't help it. Uh, and you're just falling in. So many times it comes on suddenly. Uh, for some people it comes on, they can kind of tell. And sometimes I can kind of tell, you know, I'm getting there. Other times it's just, it's happening right now. Oh, wow. So it varies. And, and that's the most complicated part with narcolepsy is that there's a lot of different symptoms involved in it. Um, and then, and it's different with everybody as far as when it comes down to treatments, when it comes to whether or not you're able to handle some medications, the cor comorbidities, the things that happen along with your narcolepsy can be very, very differently. And then how, you know, we get through life varies very differently. You know, I have a full-time job, but there's many people that, that, you know, they take a shower and, you know, make breakfast and do a load of laundry and that's their day. Wow. Um, and there are times for me exhausted. too that I'll sleep for three days in a row. That's called hypersomnia. So, you know, I, I can make it through the week, but at the end of the week, you know, I'm like dead to the world. It's strange, huh? So different wow. people react differently and we all have to kind of adjust uh, accordingly to the best of our abilities. Yeah, and you talk about that, uh, you know, you can have symptoms, but there's like kind of a low awareness and there's misconceptions around, you know, just because I fall asleep at the end of the day super fast right. doesn't mean. Yeah, and that's uh, part of the, the, the struggle and understanding uh, of how it is. You know, we may sleep a lot, but it's not restful sleep. Matter of fact, I mean, it, it's exhausting. I wake up more exhausted than when I went to sleep. Because you're in these dreams and it's so interactive, uh, your mind, your body, it doesn't shut off. Hmm. So you're, it's like you're constantly awake, but with your eyes closed. So unfortunately, there's a misconception. People think, oh, yeah, he's always sleeping. Or, you know, he's just lazy. Or, you know, it, well, it must be nice to get all that sleep. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> you know, it's, I'd rather not sleep. Uh, there are things we want to do and, and we just can't. And, and that's when it gets really emotional, really uh, more in the, the mental part for us is because it, because your body physically can't do something and your mind as well is involved in it. It's really hard for us to you know, keep it going mentally, physically, um, spiritually, everything. We're, we just got to really count on a lot of support from, you know, from ourselves and our partners and um, those around us. Yeah. And uh, you said a lot of uh, a lot of people that may be suffering from uh, narcolepsy are undiagnosed, like ADHD, like you said, epilepsy. Is, would you recommend anyone that maybe has these to also, you know, hey, check out, you know, do a sleep study or something like that? Or yeah, if, if sleep is a big part of it, so you're just feeling exhausted all the time. So for me, I, I, I couldn't even tell you what restful sleep is like because I wake up every morning totally exhausted. So that, you know, if you're feeling that way, but um, doctors have said that, well, maybe you got ADHD or, or something else, uh, you probably want to go to a sleep specialist. So there are a couple different doctors involved in it. Um, one's like a neuro, um, I want to say a neuroscientist, but a uh, neurologist, there we go, that's more involved in, uh, you know, things with the sleep and the mind and stuff like that. 
And then there are those that are like a, a pulmonary or cardiologist type because you might be exhausted because you don't breathe right. Maybe like me, you're a little bit overweight. Um, and so I had, uh, you know, maybe there's something in your, your throat or your air uh, breathing system that isn't quite right. And therefore, it's not really a, a mental issue or a brain issue or a neurological issue, but maybe it's a physical issue. Hmm. So for me, the first steps for me really, or one of the steps was when my son was little, bouncing on my knee, he, his head went right up and uh, into my nose. And so it was kind of a broken nose I've had or deviated septum for 20 plus years, 30 years. So I had surgery to, surgery to correct that. Maybe that would help, right? Also, my uvula was uh, infected, and so I had um, some surgery to get my tonsils out as well mm. as my uvula. And, and so, you know, that might help as well. Did it? Well, maybe. <laughs> but overall, no, it really didn't do anything for me. But in some people, that is something that helps. Uh, they may further have issues and just being on what's called a CPAP, which circulates or blows air into okay. you, yeah, I've heard about that those. opens up the airways. And so for a lot of people, that machine right there helps. Now, my wife doesn't have narcolepsy, but she uses a CPAP to help mm. her sleep better. You know, for me, when I use a sleep pap, I, I got hot at night. I flip it off. I, I wear it on my head. I, <laughs> I do stuff with it all night. I, I, it just doesn't stay on. It doesn't work, you know? So that didn't work out so well. So for me, it was more of a nuisance. It made me even more tired because I wasn't wearing it most of the time. Yeah. I was playing with it in my sleep. So for some people, you know, maybe it's that, and that's all that they need. So, you know, hopefully their family doctor can help with that. Um, and there will usually be a sleep study involved in it, or you know the the doctor will take a look and maybe mm-hmm. can help you. Once f- from there, if if nothing helps and you're still exhausted, keep you know keep researching, keep asking questions, keep talking to the doctor, maybe see another doctor. Um, and, and when you go through sleep tests, that helps to confirm whether or not you have it. Um, they can even go further and do. Um, blood work or spinal tap not not everyone goes through that not everybody wants to do that um it, it's bad enough going through all the sleep tests yeah, but yeah. i know i thought my son had it so he was having problems just like me and i'm like uh because it can't be genetic sure yeah, and, makes sense, and yeah. so here again you know what set him off well he got nailed in the head when he played soccer as a kid he had a concussion oh, wow. for like three months it took for it to go away so i thought that could have been a trigger he had problems in class, seeing, he, you know, was he falling asleep or this? So he went through the sleep test. Turned out it was just an iron deficiency. Oh, wow. So all he needs to do is take his iron. Okay. Well, for me, too, I have an iron deficiency, so that's one of the th- many things I got to do. But for him, that was the solution. Yeah, because the iron, I guess, t- uh, increases your hemoglobin, which is the oxygen yeah, carrier. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, so. so it might be something simple as that, or if you're a little bit more unfortunate, it, it, It'll take more, and yeah. uh, then you got to do different things. So, yeah, just yeah, keep pursuing that until you finally get that restful sleep. Yeah, and um, we're coming coming off the, uh, I guess, Sleep Awareness Week ended yesterday. Yeah, so this is a very busy month. <laughs> so for uh, so a lot of people know you spring forward. Uh, you lose that hour of sleep, which uh, for some people, that's enough to throw them off, you know? So... If you have narcolepsy, you feel like you haven't slept in two to three days every day. That's how you feel. So imagine losing one hour, but actually you stay up for two or three days and then never catch up on that sleep. And it's just, you know, how do you feel? You know, it's harder to do things, get motivated to do things. And, you know, it affects your mood. It affects everything. And because it's... <laughs> Not a lot of people can even stay up two to three days to begin with. Right. Um, but so they, they kind of bring it uh, this time of years when they bring up a, a lot of uh, sleep awareness, narcolepsy awareness, um, because, you know, that's a little taste of how we kind of feel all the time is losing that one hour of sleep. So there was a sleepy Saturday, uh, which is a lot of events occurring during the day. 
uh, encouragement just people take naps and you know kind of relax and 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 there's a couple activities during that day this is like sleep awareness week yeah so there's that and there's also uh world uh narcolepsy day or world sleep day okay. was on friday um, so I guess for anyone that went out and partied on uh, St. Patty's Day, <laughs> they appreciated uh, World Sleep Day the very next day. Yeah, take a break. <laughs> yeah, that worked good. But I mean, good. so, you know, those two things right there, just losing an hour of sleep or going out partying a long time, and you feel exhausted the next morning. And that's uh, how we feel every single day, every single minute, unfortunately. Yeah, I know there's uh, just this week they talked about... Uh getting rid of daylight savings so we're always yeah and then i thought that it had momentum and then i just read this morning that now it's been kind of stalled oh is house, it so. <laughs> yeah and so. there are debates on which one's better um some think daylight's better um some will say like you know, the evening is more uh, or the other uh, yeah, the way is more later, towards a circadian rhythm so there's some debates i think more are more people are for the more daylight part yeah, of yeah, it yeah. but then others especially the sleep doctor side of it the uh, medical professionals they're more wary than oh well it's affecting your sleep even more so it's getting even worse if you do that so i think one of the the things that we kind of think about when it comes to sleep and it's really hard for like shift workers mm -hmm. um, is try to regulate your sleep so whether or not you have narcolepsy or or not uh, you want good sleep hygiene so you try to go to sleep at a certain time, get a certain amount of hours to sleep. Um, encourage, I mean, even if you're not having narcolepsy, doctors will always encourage you to take naps. My dad always did. I, I never understood that. <laughs> right. I never needed it until more recently in the past 10, 15 years. I never took naps. Yeah, and what is a good quality nap? Because you kind of talk about it's almost better to take two or three short naps than it is one long nap. Yeah, and that's what doctors uh, recommend now. It's not always easy because depending on whether or not you can fall asleep right away, uh, some people it's really just, uh, you know, kind of relax. And so for some people it's just a matter of turning things off for 20, 30 minutes. So that's usually the optimal time. Uh, some doctors feel like, well, if you do it too much longer than that, remember, you're going to get into REM sleep. So if you do more than 20, 30 minutes, if you do 60, now you're hitting REM. Now you're even harder to get up. Mm. And so if you hit REM a little bit earlier, now with narcolepsy, it's a little bit harder. We might hit REM within two minutes. Yeah, I was going to say, you were taking, you So know. It, it can be very hard anyways. But so... And it depends on the person. So some people actually feel better if they sleep a little bit longer. But otherwise, sometimes you just need to lay down for a little bit yeah. or the opportunity to do that. So that was one of the things when I came to my current employer, uh, Quorum, is that I want to take naps. Uh, but there's a room there, um, you know, for various reasons. If you need something, there's a private room that if I needed to take a nap, it's there. Nice. And I can do it. And so, I mean, I've actually taken a couple of naps there. But, you know, I, so I don't do it every day, um, although a lot of doctors will, uh, you know, recommend that you do that every day. Mm -hmm. So, again, it depends on the person, but it generally does help and gets you refreshed and thinking again. Yeah. So it's just one of those things you got to take it, like, in moderation, mm -hmm. right? So 20 to 30 minutes or so, that's... That's moderation. More than that, I mean, that's maybe too much. And you might have a harder time sleeping at night then if you take too much during the day. Yeah, you got to be careful on that. And then that can yeah. kind of trigger you as yeah. well. Have you, uh, have you tried meditation? You know, that's a good point. So one of the things is uh, meditation or what's the other, and I can't remember offhand what the other terminology is, where you, you, you put things in a different perspective. Oh, uh, it's escaping my mind, unfortunately. Uh, it's like body and mind awareness kind okay. of deal. Um, it's kind of like you're eating food and you're not just eating food, but you're tasting the food, oh. the texture, the, you know, every, yeah, the, you right. know, you're savoring that. So it's really getting into that. And so that's another thing. So this is something that's, you know, it, it's not very easy for me. I, mean, I meditate, I'll fall asleep. <laughs> um, <laughs> but if you do it with a group, uh, and there are studies that are now looking into it, and there are studies that do this. 
So that's something that I'm trying to get into, but I haven't right now. Yeah, there's some there's uh, some apps like anything else. There's mm-hmm. uh, there's Tara Brock. There's kind of like these, uh, you know, talking meditations almost. Like you know, uh, make sure you relax your fingers or you know. Yeah, and, and I know someone with narcolepsy. She does that. Yeah, yeah. and th- they even say like you know like you know just relax your your smile and you just don't even realize that you've been smiling or you know relax your shoulders and it's like yeah so we do get tense oh yeah and i'm that way all the time i mean i think i'm relaxed and i'm constantly tensed (laughs) when i'm relaxed i'm afraid i'm gonna just be out (laughs) yeah so um talk about uh, what brings on an episode you talk about inactivity um and then not uh trying not to do things for a long period of time yeah so when certain things get monotonous um you might fall into, well, I get a lot of micro sleeps. So a micro sleep is really you're, you're dreaming, you're continuing your dream from like last night or whatever, and it's just going on. It hasn't stopped when you woke up. So all during the day, you get these little um, couple seconds worth of your dream that still continues on continuously. It's just a couple of frames coming oh, in here. Yeah, yeah. And it's wow. just, you know, it could be every minute, it could be every few minutes, depending on whether or not you're active doing something else, your mind doing something else. But so if you're doing something repetitive, sometimes you might get a lot more increase in frequency of your micro sleeps. Um, so for me, I mean, one example was I was doing something, uh, just an Excel spreadsheet, kind of monotonous. It's about 45 minute task or something, but it's really just copy paste, copy paste, whatever. And so in that period of time, I, you know, my micro sleep, I was Santa Claus handing out presents during that time. Oh, wow, so you go on this automatic behavior, you're doing things, you're doing things right, but you don't know when you got done, you don't know how you got there. Yeah. And that happens sometimes with us is that we go on this automatic behavior, we're doing stuff, but we just don't remember that whole task that we just yeah. did. We just remember, oh, it was done. Well, who did that? <laughs> oh, I'd be like, you did. When? <laughs> wow. So, uh, That's nice. I'd that much rather hand out presents these... than copy paste an yeah. Excel spreadsheet. So when you get something that's kind of monotonous, so, um, so uh, I kind of people with narcolepsy tend to be, in my view, very creative. Um, you know, I know a lot of artists, sculptures. Um, they s- tend to be problem solvers, um, thought leaders. Because we're always trying to think of ways to do something better, uh, because more efficient, because we can't always do these tasks that take us a long time to do. Um, and, and that can be, you know, it, it hurt me for a while. And I, and I wrote about this in a blog post I once wrote called Pit Train Narcolepsy, that oftentimes I was afraid to start something because I was afraid I wouldn't finish it. And then you become, then you're, you're pushing things off. But, and that's the way it was, was that if it's something monotonous, you know, I may fall asleep doing it. Mm-hmm. So you would rather do something that you think you can finish. So we're always trying to think of better ways to do things. That's good. So it, it's shorter, it's faster, it's more efficient. And so that's kind of what we do a lot of the times is kind of figure those things out. So I, a lot of people I know that have narcolepsy are, are very creative in what they do. And because of what we have to go through, they're also like one of the nicest people, most understanding people. Because, you know, it, it's so different, again, from one person with narcolepsy to another. You know, I, if I meet with the support group, there might be 20 of us. Out of that, there's probably, I don't know, maybe half of us have a full-time job. The other yes. half don't. Oh, wow. Well, you know, because we have it different, you know, not only from one another, but I might, I got good days, I got bad days, you know. So, the, you know, it, depending on, again, the medication, your environment, all these different factors. So even with narcolepsy, you got to be understanding of other people mm-hmm. with it because they're going through, it could be a lot worse than you, it could be better f- for a while. Yeah. So we're all there to help each other and support no matter what. Yeah, and I so think you definitely need that. It sounds like you got a good support around you oh, yeah. at your house and yeah. the family as well. And uh, you talked about your uh, vlog, Picturing Narcolepsy. We're going to yeah. put a link down in the description so anybody wants to check that out. But talk about what kind of brought that on and kind of helped your therapy. So in uh, all my years, so I'm 
over 50 now. So I've been dealing with narcolepsy for, that I remember 25, 30 years, no, 40 years. I've been diagnosed for about 25 years now. So, and I've had dozens of sleep tests. And so I had a doctor who was one of the top doctors in neurology and sleep studies. And um, so he wanted to do an interview with me. There was a pharmaceutical company. There was a, a, um, a medication that I used that, you know, I thought they would never want to talk to me because I used it and it didn't work. And so, you know, it was a failure for me. And so, but this company wanted to find out, you know, I, I started using it again. It's really, you know, what happened, what failed. And cause that was kind of a complicated case. And so this five minute interview turned into this whole big webcast. And so in order to do that webcast, I also had to fill out a patient interview. And so it was about two dozen pages or so of detailed, you know, my narcolepsy from when I was a kid, every detail that I can remember. And so that was the first time I really sat down and, you know, wrote all that. And so I kind of wanted to keep that in mind and, and, you know, there's so much, so different. You know, what's happening with me now with narcolepsy is totally different back in college. In college, I used to have a lot of sleep paralysis. I used to break my teeth all the time and not even know it, not even care. That's from the gritting of the teeth? Yeah, so that's yeah. One of the so symptoms. I used to grind yeah. my teeth. I used to run circles in a house, screaming and, and run from bed and do circles. So oh. I don't do that now. I do no. different stuff now. <laughs> so even as I progress in age... Uh, you know, different symptoms, different things come along. And so I, I did a blog once upon a time just to take all that information. And it can be a long history. So I just kind of framed it. Uh, you know, I kind of took that what's called a hypocretin. It was a picture I found like on, on Wikipedia that just shows that molecule, the molecule, the enzyme, or I think that's what it is, an enzyme. And so I really just uh, changed the color of it according to whatever I was explaining. So I had a couple different frames, like, you know, back to black again. And so I would make it black and white uh, picture because it would be like, okay, I'm doing good. And then I fell back into a bad part of my life. And so and I kind of talk about this in other places was that as I go throughout my years, I get higher highs and lower lows. So, you know, you're doing good, you're doing good. You know, right now I'm doing good, helping to raise narcolepsy awareness and all that. But as my life is going on right now, I'm, my biggest factor is dealing with depression. I mean, even my dreams, I'm looking for someone to shoot me, someone to kill me. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I've never had that before. And so I'm dealing with depression right now a lot. So you get to this higher highs and you just, you know, eventually you hit your lower lows. Uh, when I lost my job, I mean, that was a, a, a low. And then I got a job with Quarrel, and, and now I got my high. And, and so you kind of go through that. And so that blog kind of showed, um, using kind of short paragraphs, I used little frames and short sentences and, and kind of did that. And that was back, what, five years ago, maybe more than that. Well, once upon, later on, once I joined a support group, uh, met other people with narcolepsy, again, many artists, were in there. Um, I asked uh, one of the people with narcolepsy to read my blog and do paintings for each of those frames. So I think I had 18 mm -hmm. different emotions or times in my life that explained something. And I just wanted her interpretation of it, whatever that might be. And so um, she was great. And so yeah, the, she yeah, ended up painting uh, those paintings for me. So each one of those things now have a, a painting associated with it so and you know i have a blog and i got digital copies of it but yeah it's, uh, it's know, brilliant again i definitely recommend anyone to she, check it out she made this uh she actually gave me the paintings oh wow so okay. i have them with me you get the actual and yeah. so it's it's just really fascinating for me to um, have this in my hand so I, I wanted the actual paintings because i when I look at the, I don't even have to read my blog. When I look at these paintings that she made for me, uh, I can already feel what I was at that period of time. So, um, yeah, it, it was kind of something I did for myself once upon a time, and, and I kind of released it a few times just in public, just on Facebook. Get people read it, try to understand more. Mm -hmm. But really, uh, and unfortunately, uh, I, I did it all right before I got uh, 
terminated or fired from my last job and went through some legal stuff and they're able to <laughs> use a lot of what I said against me because I was being honest. Yeah. You know, and so that's what it was. It was really just pouring out whatever it was, being honest with myself and everybody else, what I'm trying, you know, what I'm experiencing. And one of the things I wrote even towards the end of it was, again, going back to sleep hygiene. So easier said than done. So a great thing with sleep hygiene is, okay, go to bed at the same time every day. So you go to bed, say 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, get up at 7 or 8. Well, if you fall asleep on the couch at 7 o'clock and, and you don't wake up, well, it's hard to keep that sleep hygiene. Now you've already ruined it. It might be 5 o'clock I fall asleep or whatever. And you fall asleep that quick. You sit down and watch TV and you're gone. So it's hard. It's easy to say have sleep hygiene. It's hard to have it when you fall asleep within two minutes and right. <laughs> and you've already ruined it before you even <laughs> right. had a chance to do it. So at the end of uh, my blog, a uh, couple of frames was I watched watch something on TV. It was on the news and it was an interview of someone who had narcolepsy, and she used you know with their medications and good sleep hygiene. You know, she led a normal life. She worked full time and all this. And so I talk about how I failed to do the same thing. Um, it, it came easy for her. It, it wasn't throughout my life. It has not been easy for me to do the same thing. And so it's been more of a struggle for me to get to that. But yeah, ultimately, I mean, you want to do what that person did. That, that'd be the perfect thing to do mm -hmm. if you can do it. So even with the, that interview I did one time, uh, for that pharmaceutical company. And that's how, what made that blog was, you know, when I started on their medication, it's a sodium ox, oxybate, I think it's a chemical compound. Um, and, and so what it is, is it's a medication that you got to take uh, twice a night. Well, it's kind of hard to take it the second time a night. I would dream. Twice at night? Yeah. Oh, wow. So you take it when you go to bed and you got to wake up about four hours later and take it. Which, you know, some people can do that. For me, I dreamt about taking it. Half the time I didn't take it, hmm. you know. And so it was, it was difficult. Now, they have different ones now that you only take it one time. Um, but really, it was something to help with uh, kind of suppress your dreams and, and help with the excessive daytime sleepiness. But it just didn't work for me. Well, the first time it didn't work for me because I just went at the highest level right away. And so it, it floored me, literally floored me. Like, I had the biggest headache of my life. I could not get my head off the floor to mm. take my second dose. Wow. And so I just stopped. I poured it out. You know, it's a regular, it's a narcotic, so it's regulated. So I poured it out. And so I, I stayed away from it for years. And then when I came, moved to Houston from Cleveland, my doctor wanted me to go back on it. He titrated me up, starting at a lower level, went up, went up. So that was good. The problem with that later on was that with it, it may cause you to stop breathing, so you need to use a CPAP. But I had problems using a CPAP. Yeah. Also, the higher doses later on didn't help me. So what might knock out a person and what did knock me out uh, once upon a time right away no longer did anything to me. And so I just built up my tolerance to it so quickly. But so that company was very interested in hearing, oh, yeah, you know, I did it one time, I failed, and I was on it a second time. At that time, I was still going through it. And it wasn't, and, and my whole thing that came out of it was, was that the medication, I mean, it works great. A lot of narcolepsy, people with narcolepsy use it. And, um, and so it's very helpful for them. So for me and a few others, it didn't quite work. But it wasn't that the drug failed me, I failed it. Hmm. Because again, sleep hygiene. I, I couldn't do what I needed to do to be on that medication, to use that CPAP to keep my airwaves open, right. to make that a successful medication hmm. for me. So a lot of times it isn't the medication failed or something like that. It's a whole bunch of other factors that come into it. It yeah. makes the whole thing a struggle. But where is diet in all of this? Diet's a big portion of it too. Um, Many people that have narcolepsy, their medication actually suppresses their appetite. And so a lot of people have trouble remembering to eat or keep eating. Hmm. Um, unfortunately, I'm the opposite. For me, uh, I tend to have uh, urges to eat, um, which might kind of go more towards the hypersomnia part, 
where you tend to sleep more and you tend to eat more. Um, but so diet's very, you know, it's just important to keep at a good weight because again, the more weight you gain, the more it affects your breathing. Mm -hmm. Um, so, but actually a lot of people with narcolepsy go the opposite way where they lose weight. It's going to be kind of lanky. Yeah. Um, this is kind of a little bit, uh, off it, but just cause it is sleep related and that kind of thing that, uh, what do you think sleep is? <laughs> what sleep is for your mind to kind of reset and, well, hopefully just rest. But I, I, I don't know. I think sleep kind of connects a lot of dots that happen during the day um, and, and kind of get you, your mind, you know, I think it really is to connect those dots, uh, maybe resolve some issues or something. You know, there's a lot of stuff that happens, not just during the day, with say with work. But, you know, you got family issues, family in different parts of the country or the world. There's different world issues. There, there's tons of stuff that hit us every single day. And, and so it's so vast, you don't even know it. So, I mean, if you catch something on TV, uh, you know, something going on in Ukraine and, and, you know, you really feel for it, but you can't do anything about it. And, you know, you're rushed, you're doing something else. But you know what? That might come back in your dream and have an, because it really touched you, but in that brief moment but then you had to go do something else so there's so much hitting us every single day i mean personally i think it's just a matter of taking all that in and and connecting some dots with it mm -hmm. so, yeah there's some dream books and stuff of kind of you know there's yeah. like a snake or you know if you have like these recurring things and that kind of yeah you know i i don't get a lot of recurring ones i get a few if i have uh if i have a high fever i tend to have a few reoccurring things of uh you know with being on something very high and something shaky and I'm about to fall off of it or a carnival with down below I won you know again not scary just for me more adventurous but other than that my dreams are so different every night you know and, and they're pretty awesome I mean I've toured so many cities that <laughs> you know just the houses everything everything's just awesome um, so the best dreams then become your worst dreams. Yeah. You just can't shake it. And, you know, sometimes it was like kind of neat. Hey, you know, you just want to keep sleeping because of that. I've, I've had dreams in the past and I was talking with my son about this earlier. Uh, actually today was, you know, I used to have dreams that I was always trying to finish something. So I wouldn't wake up until I was finished with something. And so, I don't know, maybe that was more work-related or, or something, I don't know. But nowadays, it's that I want to wake up and I just can't. And so, I'm, again, looking for something, so, someone to get me out of it. So, I'm not looking to finish a task that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I'm just looking for something to end it. Yeah, Nightmare and so, on Elm Street. Yeah. yeah. But, again, for me, it's not scary. It's just another adventure for me. But it's always different for me. So many hours of sleep do you get? <laughs> It all depends. So normally on a normal night, hopefully, um, you know, probably like six to eight hours or something like that. That's solid, yeah. That's and but it's broken up. You know, I might get, and then you're also talking about some naps during the day and stuff. So it can be broken up where I, I fall asleep and then I'm I'm up for a few hours or I fall asleep again uh, right away. And so yeah, I, I tend to wake up probably. I don't know, probably about 10 times a night or so, just flipping over, doing this, or thinking about something. But I usually fall asleep right away again, um, or my mind just start thinking. So one of my problems is I can't shut off my mind. And so for me, the best way to fall asleep is just to listen to something, like mm -hmm. a cartoon. I usually listen to the same cartoon or a few cartoons over and over because I already know what they are. I don't need to watch it. Right. And by hearing the same thing, I'm just listening. And so uh, I'm not thinking about stuff. And so that helps me to fall asleep. Other people have other methods of doing it. But, yeah. but for me, again, come the weekend, I'm exhausted. So I'm, you know, I've had weekends, Friday I fall asleep, and I don't wake up till Sunday. Now I might wake up, you know, go to the bathroom or grab something to eat, but I'm, I'm pretty much gone. Uh, for that weekend. And are those like sleepwalking episodes or do you remember? No, it's that? just sleep. Just, hey guys, I'm just, yeah, I'm gonna I might be a up, but, I'm gonna... you know, I might go from a bed to a couch yeah. to another bed or, you know, because, you know, it's, 
it hurts your back after a while too and your body <laughs> yeah right what's I mean, your sleep I, I've, number i've slept huh? on the floor on the yeah, doggy right. bed with my dogs i, what's your I can sleep? sleep anywhere really um so yeah so for me if i'm in that and i have a hard time then it, it can be a whole weekend thing uh-huh. and so my wife knows i'm probably not going to do a lot on saturday yeah so sunday that's usually the day that i do a lot again it all depends on how it was and your sleep week. room, your bedroom, I mean, that's just totally darked out. I mean, that's... Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, tape I mean, even when I or... watch the TV, you can turn a picture off and listen to the sound. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm amazed. I mean, I want to be like my dogs where for some reason they like to sleep in a room with a light on. It's like it doesn't bother <laughs> them, but, but yeah. I mean, anytime I can fall asleep anywhere or anything, but if I'm... For good sleep hygiene, you really want to make it the the best condition, which is darkness, quiet um, for most people, um, and, and more on the cooler side than the hotter side generally are the, the best sleep conditions for most people. And anyone that maybe thinks they have narcolepsy, what would be like kind of the steps in, uh, you know, even just anybody that's overly tired, I guess there are, you yeah, know, well, I mean, that's a symptom of you everything. Can kinda, but, there's a lot of resources online. Yeah, we'll definitely look we'll put some down in the description as well. Um, you can always uh, even join one of the, the support calls to kind of hear what we go through, people with narcolepsy go through. Um, but a lot of times it's really a lot of people do their own research to look up, uh, you know, what kind of symptoms they have. Don't diagnose yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes people read things and they kind of then think they got something just by leading down that path. Or they kind of use what they read to complete what they have. Mm-hmm. So I wouldn't do that, but at least gain knowledge about it. And, and I'm terrible about that. I, I'm not the best at researching, although a lot of people with narcolepsy are very, very good. Again, a lot of them are in a the medical field, so they're really good with that to begin yeah, with. But a lot that. of people are very good with knowledgeable about this stuff. I, I'm not as knowledgeable as a lot of people with narcolepsy. Yeah. But again, my wife is, <laughs> she's the one that does very well. So she yeah, kind of does that research for to... me. So kind of look at that and, and really talk to doctors. And if you don't think you're getting the answer, you're not getting the help, you're not feeling restful, then maybe you need to see a sleep specialist. And I think also it's important for people to know that, uh, okay, you do hear the words from the doctor, whomever, and they say you have narcolepsy. It's not necessarily you have to do medications. It's not, you know, there are things like you're saying, the sleep hygiene, start with that. And and everybody can probably start with with better hygiene for sure, whether you have uh, narcolepsy formally or not. Oh, right. Yeah, uh, medication, um, you know, there are different medications too. There are low-level medications and they go all the way to the higher levels, which are really um, nervous system type medications mm. helping to deal with that. But you know, there are you know the over the counter medications that help you sleep. You know, if you want to look at just something simple, melatonin. Mm. You know, so which is uh, just something to help uh, get you to sleep. So when I first had narcolepsy, um, one of the problems I had, and sometimes I still struggle with it, is. I cannot fall asleep when I want to, but I fall asleep when I don't want to. Okay. So you get like the insomnia when you don't want to, and then you get, you know, falling asleep right away when you, the daytime sleepiness and stuff. So for me, it was like, you know, now that I'm laying down, I can't fall asleep, but yet I'm so exhausted. And, you know, eventually I'll fall asleep, but by then, you know, it's, it's too late into it. So, but melatonin kind of helps to bring that to more natural to get you into uh, sleep. So, you know, start with that. That's Make, good, yeah. Sure, you know, your iron levels are good. So certain things with your family doctor you can do. But if those things aren't helping and you're not, you know, and you're practicing good sleep hygiene and that's not helping, you know, then it's probably start to time, time to start to talk to a, a sleep specialist yeah. and find out, you know, is there something else? I mean, it could be medical. I mean, you might, if you see an ear, nose, and throat doctor in the ENT, um, you know, he might think, you know, if you feel you have a deviated septum, like I knew I had one yeah. from my child, um, or if your throat, you know, you have some trouble breathing, you know, it might be a physical issue first. Oh, that can, yeah. So that doesn't always solve it, didn't solve it for me. And then in that case, you start going further. But once you start going to a sleep specialist, then you're going to get into doing sleep studies. So usually an overnight sleep study. Um, you know, but my wife, for her sleep apnea, 
or the CPAP. She just did an at-home sleep test. She didn't have to go in. Nice. But for mine, mine was a more difficult issue. Yeah. So I've had dozens <laughs> of uh, overnight stays at different yeah. places. I think it's also important for everyone to hear that you've been dealing with this for 30, 40 years. Right. And although it is something that you deal with on a daily, even, um, you know, you and I were going to have this interview a couple of days ago and you kind of felt that brain fog and, mm-hmm. and just needed to kind of be aware of that and just say, hey, can we postpone? And, right. and of course, there's no problem. But yeah, I mean, it's just uh, just something that you got to, you know, yeah, you know, it's one of, in October, so we talked about events occurring right now. In October, we have a lot of disability awareness. So there's visible disabilities, invisible disabilities, and some people have both. So, you know, they might be on crutches and also have narcolepsy. So they have a visible disability uh, or a cane or a wheelchair, so a visible one, and then they got an invisible one as well. And so that month is National Disability Employment Awareness Month, and a lot of disability awareness. So with narcolepsy, again, this is just one invisible illness that's out there, Uh, you know, chronic one. There's many others. Um, One of the things that narcolepsy, when you talk about, say, with employment or just, you know, in general, or people with uh, awareness and um, empathy and just with companies being uh, diversity and inclusion and equity, being, you know, whatever the disability is to get them involved and, and kind of uh, become aware of, of who they are, not to, like, change them or to try to understand everything you can't. I mean, even with narcolepsy, I can't understand everything about it or how someone else with it feels, mm-hmm. you know, because I don't have those hypnagogic hallucinations, those, you know, terrors or spirits or demons after me. So I really can't understand that part of it, yeah. whereas a lot of people do have that. Um, same with other disabilities. So narcolepsy is just one of so many other invisible disabilities that, you know, just trying to understand uh, and you know, if, if a person needs help and, and not just assume that if somebody looks good, that they are good. Mm-hmm. Um, because I know other people that I, I didn't know that they had narcolepsy, but since then they've come out and told me or, you know, other ones. So I, I, I just, you know, for grins at work one time, I posted something in, for a Disability Awareness Week. And it was like, I have an invisible disability and it was blank and I put in narcolepsy. And just, you know, and, and then people responded to me, just sent me back uh, emails with the same thing, saying what their invisible disability was. Oh, nice. Like, I had no idea. And, you know, <laughs> you know, it's not like you're going to need to know and understand everything about them, but just understand that people, you know, by nature, we're all trying to do the best we can, the best way we can, and help each other. And just be aware of, you know, if they need something uh, to help, or maybe helping them is just... You know, letting them do their thing to get over their situation um, and just understanding about what they might occur. Now, not everyone can be open about it. And right. that's yeah. kind of one Different of the, place. the problems with any hidden disability, especially if you're younger, you're afraid to come out with it because you can be discriminated against. Um, you know, you're, you're probably already feeling it from your friends when you can't go out to some event at night. So it's already, you're feeling already pressure right there. And then, um, and sometimes it can become a safety issue because, you know, if if you can't reveal that you have this disability and someone expects you to be somewhere and you just go because you have to be there, well, now it's a safety issue if you really Mm -hmm. can't make it. Just like, you know, um, thankfully you, that we were able to reschedule this because I just couldn't make it, you know. I got all the way you know, ready, and I was in my car ready to go, <laughs> and it just hit me. It's like, I don't think I can make it there. Yeah. And then I, I tried to be like, okay, well, let's kind of talk to myself and figure out what, you know, what shape I'm really in. And after about 15 minutes, I still wasn't in shape. And, and so thank you. Thankfully, you suggested another day. And But that's sometimes what it takes is we just can't do it. Mm-hmm. You know, my son's graduation, I couldn't make it. Yeah, you know, I tough. had to watch that on video. You know, so sometimes, unfortunately, it's going to affect everybody around you, whatever your disability, narcolepsy or otherwise, Mm -hmm. whether it's visible or invisible, it's going to affect every single person around you. And and so just 
a little bit of empathy for those that have any disability. And I would say probably at least 40% of the population, maybe it's more than that, have some sort of disability. So it's not like it's infrequent. Um, there are many disabilities all around you that people have mm-hmm. that you would never know. Right. And sometimes it affects what they do. Um, sometimes something, an illness or a chronic disease won't affect what you do. And so it won't be as much of what they call a disability. But even if, you know, some people go by the word disability, I'm disabled, some do not. Whatever the case, it's, it's, it shouldn't be used as a bad word. Right. And, and some people just don't consider themselves really. I never considered narcolepsy a disability uh, until it was a temporary situation and I needed help. And then legally it became a disability. Um, but other than that, you know, it's just me trying to get through life. It's just yeah. part of my life. Well, having known you for uh, a few years now, I think, uh, yeah, definitely you are living life. And, uh, and I'm glad that you're aware of this and I'm glad that uh, you're living with it. And, and I'm glad uh, about your family as well, that they're uh, also very supportive. And because like you said, you're not the only one that's going through it. No, and, it affects uh, everybody. Yeah, and I think they hit on some good points, and I would definitely recommend anybody that uh, is out there that's dealing with uh, what could be termed as a disability or something, whether it's narcolepsy or anything else, that, uh, yeah, they reach out to others and, and find that support group and, and keep talking about it, because I think if you keep it inside, it's uh, that's kind of when it becomes a monster for yourself and, and then people around you as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for giving me this opportunity to, to talk about it and you know, hopefully for anyone that's out there, just uh, do some research, talk to your doctor, talk to other people. And really, you know, it's hard to really talk about it sometimes. Um, And it's really hard to figure out what's going on with you sometimes. But, you know, that's the first step. Awareness is the first step. Nice. So take that. Awesome. Well, I'm glad that we were uh, able to do this episode. And again, we're going to have uh, the picturing narcolepsy uh, link down below, as well as some other links uh, that might be uh, supportive and help if uh, maybe you think that you have narcolepsy or anything else that might be, uh, again, that support group. So uh, thank you so much, Brian. Thank this you, is Steve. awesome. Appreciate so, it. Take care. Thanks.